So I should begin by thanking Lena um, and the other organizers here at the MAMA. Uh, and I should also say that it's my pleasure to give a talk here in Zagreb, Croatia, which as a history of thought nerd is quite an important place for me for being one of the centers of Marxist humanism during the so-called socialist period, um, as it was the homes of one of the Praxis Journal uh, and some of its key figures. But I'm not gonna reintroduce that already familiar material for you today. I'm gonna look at a few other humanist currents and this, this talk, um, which I'm going to deliver today, is entitled How Do Our Bodies Work and Why Do They Fail Us? A Complex Answer. And um, this, is, this is kind of a preview of some research I've been doing uh, in recent years, trying to equip trans-feminist theory and also uh, the movement for intersex liberation with a view of the body which can outlast and hopefully reverse the current uh, rising tide of global fascism or far-right ideology, call it what you want. And um, a lot of the material I'm going to um, work through today doesn't really speak to that urgent matter so directly, but I think all of it is kind of going to reinforce uh, that, that direction, that kind of response um, to the global far right. And um, I think it's kind of going to reinforce our struggle, by which I mean the continued survival of reds, feminists, queers, commies, and so on. So um, I'm going to begin by um, kind of prefacing what's mostly going to be a historical investigation with the political point which I'm trying to make for you. So the queer communists are primarily two activist scholars based in Kyrgyzstan, um, Georgi Mamadov and Oksana Shatilova. Uh, and at the, at the time of uh, writing this essay in 2017, um, both Mamadov and Shatilova were members of the School of Theory and Activ Activism Bishkek, or the Stab, um, which is a research and cultural center that has served as something of a hub for LGBTQI activism in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and everything that this group, uh, the Stab, has produced is pretty fascinating, in my opinion, from like uh, their queer communist manifesto to a spoof, a historical spoof they kind of fabricated using Soviet era postcards called the Kolontai Collective. But today I just want to focus on this 2017 essay which they came out with, which is entitled Against Simple Answers, The Queer Communist Theory of Ivald Ilyenkov and Alexander Sivorov. Facing down the ascendant uh, rise of the populist right in Russia, which had an immediate, immediate impact on their own context in a former Soviet satellite state, um, where Russian TV is watched in most households, and Vladimir Putin is considered to be the single most popular politician, the queer communists uh, ended up finding, finding themselves having to kind of withdraw that activism from the kind of outward facing um, approach they'd previously taken and into more kind of closed community events. Uh, and in light of this, they felt obliged to respond by putting out an analysis which both assessed the cause of the rightward turn around the world and as importantly, I think, offers a forceful prescriptive reply um, which they think should guide the left, uh, what they call the queer communist idea as the queer communists wrote, arguably the briefest and most succinct definition of the conservative term would be this, a time of simple answers to complex questions. In the face of this, the queer communists argue that the correct task is not for the left to simplify uh, its message, in turn, matching the right, um, and, and nor, uh, so they shouldn't champion, we shouldn't champion ourselves as the guardians of the facts, um, or oppose fake news and so on, and present a kind of positivistic reason um, and certainly we, sh we shouldn't try and jettison those who are most awkward to any kind of coalition building, so trans people, migrants, the disabled, and so on. Um, instead, the queer communists argue we should embrace the complexity that the right is thriving um, through so pointedly refusing. Um, and I think this is particularly relevant, uh, relevant to us today in opposition to the, the line of the gender ideology, um, which is being pushed uh, by more and more on the right, um, particularly backed by the Catholic Church. And um, kind of, kind of uh, going against this tide, uh, the, this kind of insistence on complexity, the queer communists explain in the following fashion. Queer communism insists that capitalist exploitation not only has a universal character, an absolute majority of us are forced to sell their labor to capital, but also a particular capital, uh, a particular character, sorry. For women, homosexuals, transgender people, people of different ethnic groups, people with limited abilities and those with mental health issues, it creates specific conditions of exclusion and exploitation 
and the queer communist method of opposing this subjugation is to unite in a coalition movement which does not assume the subordination of the specific needs of different groups to one universal goal, but rather each particular need should be taken as universal. End quote. So this is um, this is kind of this is what an, an extension of what they what they call the more commonplace project of the queer idea. So they define this as anti-essentialism, a consideration of exclusion and stigma, and sort of a political and ethical radicalism. So that's that's the basic project which they're trying to extend using insights from the radical underground of the Soviet Union, which I'm going to explore a bit more later in my talk. Um, and the idea is to have a new view of human mutability and utopian uh, potential. Um, so yeah, so in short, responding to the nationalist tide, uh, we just have to refuse to simplify. And I tend to be very much in favour of like nuance and, and so on, but uh, I'm happy to kind of un unabashedly and unambiguously side with this kind of vision. And my own thinking and research in recent years has been intended to advance these kind of complex cases and look at things in the kind of uh, kind of intricate fashion they appear. So today I'm going to preview a bit of material which is going to be published soon in, in various different essays uh, on a theme I call the history of embodiment. And I'm hopeful that this is going to uh, provide us with some useful material and some useful arguments in resisting the simplified argumentation we've come to encounter on all sides. And at least in the UK um, uh, and other, other, other places I've interacted with, this is often kind of a line which comes as much from liberals and the rest of the right, uh, the rest of the, the left wing uh, as from the right wing, so you often you often find these like oversimplified arguments coming from people who are supposedly with us, but maybe aren't so much really. So a lot of the interconnections today, I'm just kind of going to hint at. So uh, like a lot of this is coming from like a transfeminist and uh, intersex liberatory lens, and some of that might be unclear. So during the questions, maybe we can um, explicate those linkages a little further. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this image, but it comes from a YouTuber called ContraPoints. She's <laughs> So I'm told. <laughs> right, so, so between Proposition 309 and 346 of the Phenomenology of Spirit, we find Hegel's attempted refutation of uh, two, two contemporary sciences of his day, um, today kind of dismissed as pseudosciences, but this time um, still, still relatively popular, physiognomy and phrenology. Physiognomists believed that, uh, and probably still believe, that the character of a person leaves marks upon their face, upon their body in, in, in general, but particularly on their face, um, which those informed by this science can be trained to determine. Um, similarly, phrenology was uh, a self-described science at the time, which believed that personality traits manifested in particular proportions of the skull, with protrusions or dips um, possible to assess as guidelines to character. These views had a lot in common with each other, uh, and also to occult practices such as palmistry, which Hegel compares them to, um, in that they held that character or personality is reflected in the shape of uh, physical characteristics, and particularly that it's measurable by proportions. Opposing these views, Hegel argues that the expressiveness of the body is not based on physical features, um, which are identif identifiable by the eye, but rather the um, deployment, so the body in action. As Hegel had it, it must be regarded as a thoroughgoing denial of reason to treat a skull bone as the actuality of conscious life. In Hegel's view, one could never um, determine immediately questions of character from any kind of, uh, any, any kind of physical form. Even what we usually think of as expressions require interpretation. So quoting an earlier critic of physiognomy, Hegel affirms that if, for example, um, we encounter someone and accuse them of frowning at us, all the, all the person we're talking to would need to kind of rebut our claim is to say, well, actually, I was thinking of something else entirely. So, in other words, human character is not a matter of spirit, uh, is, is only a matter of spirit and never one of bone. There's no place in the rationalist system Hegel carefully constructed uh, for any kind, of, any kind of assessment of that form. More recently, this seemingly um, mostly bygone and... Um, one moment. Okay, I'll look it up. Hmm. There we go. I can just use the keyboard. 
Anyway, more recently, uh, this seemingly bygone debate was picked up on and redeployed by Scottish philosopher Alastair MacIntyre in a pair of essays, Hegel on Faces and Skulls, um, and secondly, What is a Human Body? These, these kind of twin essays are, are most recently published in his um, uh, collection, Tasks of Philosophy, in 2006. In the first essay, MacIntyre argues that much of uh, what Hegel um, had identified as failings in phrenology could equally apply to contemporary overreaches of the natural sciences, particularly uh, what is sometimes called neuroreductionism. Um, and for example, this, this, se this second image I've got on the screen there is from an um, article in the popular presses, which claims that you can identify a criminal by various proportions of their, of their CAT scan. Um, so as uh, McIntyre writes about this tendency, Buried in these dubious contentions is one that is less obviously dubious, that is indeed familiar and widely accepted. I mean, of course, the thesis that there are biochemical or neural states of affairs, processes, and events, the occurrence and nature of which are the sufficient causes of human actions. This thesis wore phrenological clothing in 1807. Today its clothing is fashionable as it was then, only the fashions are not what they were. In other words, we're focusing more on the brain than the skull. Um, in other words, the more exuberant strains of neuroscience are really an updating of phrenology, a reduction of human particularity and the complex question of human character to lumps of differently sized matter measured in proportions, perhaps down to the atom. In the second essay, What is a Human Body? McIntyre describes his, uh, his, his project as a pre-philosophical one. He wants to outline what characterizes a human body and he goes through this in quite, quite nerdy detail. He makes the case uh, for the human body as expressive uh, based on cultural contingency alone. When we find ourselves in, uh, in a radically different context to those we are familiar with, even upon meeting a new person, say, never mind like plunging into another culture, some, some country you've never been to before, we need to infer from context uh, or, to be to or, or be told by an interpreter, um, especially helpfully, uh, the connotations of gestures, of sounds, most obviously with language, um, or motions that in a more homely context, once something we were more used to, we would usually grasp uh, much more readily. So for instance, when meeting a new person, a wink might either be a flirtatious gesture, a suggestive of some inside joke they're inviting you into, or perhaps both, or perhaps neither, perhaps there's another meaning that receiving a wink from, from someone you don't know so well might mean. Um, you'll probably only realise as you get to know them. So, following on from this, according to McIntyre, human bodies are at once expressive, uh, interpretable, and enigmatic. These three features all interlock with each other. The body will always serve, and here's a quote, is the, the body will always, always serve as a source of puzzlement, since alone among animal bodies, it occasionally emits the question, what is a human body, and directs its powers towards giving an answer to that question, end quote. So this is, this is a kind of thoroughly abstracted view, which uh, McIntyre calls pre-philosophical, as I've said. Um, but I've been bearing it in mind recently when considering um, a more concrete question, which is the treatment of those who are born visibly intersex. When McIntyre describes our bodies in, as interpretable, he means that um, those we encounter uh, have some kind of say. They have to perform some reading in order for our, our forms and our, our expressiveness to be understood. And this, um, this seemed to ring true when I was considering the preliminary stages of assessment of today what gets called intersex genital mutilation, um, which, for those of you who don't know, uh, is a primarily cosmetic set of surgeries which are performed on those who are identifiably intersex at birth, that is, those who are born with um, gen uh, genitals which leave them hard, hard to sort as either male or female. Uh, my most recently published piece, which is entitled Depathologizing, Repathologizing on the WHO's Guidelines for Intersex Healthcare, I describe how these, um, these um, practices by doctors have survived kind of rather doggedly into the 21st century, despite an increasing amount of pressure and lobbying from the intersex movement um, for this kind of uh, treatment of intersex children to cease. Um, despite the intersex movement's be best efforts, today most infants born identifiably uh, intersex, uh, at least in the Western world, and in many cases beyond it, increasingly in India as well, um, receive these procedures which are intended to bring them in line with either one or other normative gender, M or F. Um, and the process of them being assessed for this um, process, um, for them being sorted through this meat grinder, ultimately comes down to quite crude measurements. And this is kind of like a satirical, at the bottom, this is a satirical kind of phallometer which goes from 
just a girl to fix it quick, just squeaks by, um, just okay. And, and this is like a, this was produced by the early intersex movement as a kind of uh, satirical critique of the treatment of intersex infants. And um, it's really not kind of overstating the, the kind of crude aspect uh, of this, this kind of face of interpretation. The, um, the setup has kind of complex, uh, become more complex since 2006 uh, with kind of multidisciplinary teams often assessing these infants, but ultimately the same logic of um, normative violence uh, hasn't really transformed. So we're talking about surgeries which are probably going to uh, render the child sterile, followed by courses of hormones for the appropriate gender in one direction or the other, and generally trying to bring the bodies of intersex infants and children uh, in line with the forms expected of them by society. And it will not really surprise the more cynical and the more worldly of you um, to hear that the judgments passed by doctors are still firmly guided by heteronormative um, spirit. Uh, a phallus must be fit for penetration, or at least peeing standing up. Um, a vagina must be large enough to take an average member of the assumed boyfriend or husband um, this intersex infant is going to have in a decade and a half's time. Um, in reality, a disproportionately high number of intersex people are also LGBT identified, uh, but this is not really something which most medical professionals bother to consider and never mind understand. Um, so, so yeah, the treatment of visibly intersex infants, I think, shows us the worst side of the interpretability of our physical forms. In certain contexts, we find ourselves evaluated according to standards that will impact on us for the rest of our lives um, and receive treatment which is heedless of our values and the attachment we ourselves will come to develop. So, so far I've sort of been bouncing off men talking about men uh, and that's going to continue. So for the feminists in the room, I'm going to end this talk with like lengthy quotations from female philosophers. So don't leave just yet. Okay, so another example of, of how this, this kind of rather abstract Hegelian conception of embodiment has played out here through the history of thought in a more concrete way, uh, we need to turn to Marx and the jelly question. And specifically, this is, this is, this is kind of about the um, body under strain as part of a workforce, but since it's Marx, we're also going to talk about commodities. So I'm going to play you a quick clip that will explore this if possible. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I can do this without my mouse. Hold tight. I guess I can just, I can, I can just read you this section on Marx and then I'll show you the video as a light relief. Okay. Right, so in 2008, uh, Keith Sutherland published a piece called Marx in Jargon which I reread after a materialist feminist comrade of mine, Maya Gonzalez, uh, brought this quote to my attention um, last month. So in this 2008 essay, Sutherland observes that uh, Marx calls labor really a productive expenditure of human brains, muscles, nerves, hands, etc. Um, with that etc. being in the original text kind of trailing off. So. Um, so pursuing this kind of anatomical list, this breaking of the, the workforce down to uh, brains, muscles, nerves, hands, and etc., cetera, um, Sutherland explores how in the transition from das Kapital to capital, that is the translation from German to English, a particular term, Gelerte, was lost along the way. Gelerte refers to a gelatinous paste, uh, which in the 19th century um, would be bought frozen, having already been harvested, usually from a kind of undifferentiated slot of animals. And Sutherland argues that galata, this lost word in the English translation, um, is key to grasping Marx's view of how laboring bodies are reduced from their kind of concrete um, muscular form uh, into the abstraction of value. Okay, I'm gonna read out a quote from Sutherland. A gruesome satirical echo of the allegorical account of the abstract labor as galata um, makes the living hands, brains, muscles, and nerves of the wage labourer uh, reduced to mere animal substances, ingredients at the feast of the capitalist. The capitalist, in turn, is the great devourer of this undifferentiated human labour. He is not an individual, as Marx says, but is a mere embodiment of capital, which makes him not just the oppressor of the workers in theory and in practice, but also gives him a specific role in Marx's allegorical satire on consumerism. The capitalist is roughly the industrial processing of the workers in reverse. The worker who starts out as a real body and brain is reduced to galata through submission to capitalist wage labor, 
and the capitalist who is in essence nothing but capital itself, nonetheless assumes in his interactions with human beings the local habitation of a body and the name of an individual. So, through this processing, the workforce is reduced to jelly paste by the demands of capital, heaving bodies generating the abstraction value from the slog of their concrete forms. Marx's visceral metaphor highlights the brutality of labour, the grinding down and the liquefaction um, required by the extraction of value from labour power, and that's the thing which is always going to demand. Um, I'll just give you one more quote from Sutherland. So he says, Its fetish character may prevent the bourgeois consumer from seeing in Galata the brains, muscles, nerves, and hands themselves, that is, the substance of the paradigmatic commodity, may be undifferentiable back into the aggregate of its living human origins by any act merely of conscientious perception. But the bourgeois consumer who thus compulsorily worships the commodity as an idol is nonetheless cast by Marx's satire into the role of the child who daily begs to lick the cauldron clean after daily observing the mess of human history boil in it. Can the bourgeois consumer exit the stage of this satire, protesting his abstinence or his vegetarianism? No, he cannot, because the rendering of human minds and bodies into galetta is not, on the terms of Marx's satire, an abuse of wage labour by the coven of leading unreconstructed vampires, but rather the fundamental law of all wage labour. So what Sutherland doesn't argue, but which I'm going to argue here, uh, is that this argument by Marx in Das Kapital adopts the, the Hegelian view of embodiment, which I've already outlined, to the question of the specific form uh, of alienation which is endured um, by anyone toiling in a capitalist workforce. The disintegration and congealment um, into jelly described here is intended exactly to be horrifying on a quite humanistic ground. And now I'll try and show you this video. So on that note, I think we're going to leave the 19th century for the mid-20th. Um, okay, so, so some, of you, some of you here, as you've come along to a feminist talk, will already be familiar with Simone de Beauvoir. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try, try a bit of a rereading. Um, in the mid-1940s, the body was entering center stage in an influential school of thought named existentialism. Simone de Beauvoir often gets discussed in terms of her intellectual partnership um, with Jean-Paul Sartre, given their lengthy relationship, uh, which was quite defining for each of them. More recently, however, scholars of intellectual history have begun to explore the commonalities of her thought uh, with another of her peers, Maurice Merleau-Ponty. From this view, Merleau-Ponty and Beauvoir's twin project was identifying the failure of existing accounts, um, whether psychological uh, or modal economic accounts, uh, to account for the ambiguity of the body's pathway through the world. Each of these thinkers attempted to grasp at the existential core and self-fashioning, which is always present in embodiment. This is clearest on the level of approach. Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology of perception and Beauvoir's The Second Se Sex um, both share this kind of polyphonic aspect, this use of various different voices to try and explore um, the matter at hand. Throughout the phenomenology of perception, we see contrasted two myths, the myth of the mental and the myth of the empirical. Whereas mentalists would forever be sceptical about the means by which the body made sense of the world in the Kantian vein, um, empiricists would always be overly keen on itemizing and breaking experiences down into measurable component parts. By contrast, the phenomenology Merleau-Ponty advocated um, responded directly to the halting and grasping way that sense appeared um, from the body, um, making and feeling its way through the world. Merleau-Ponty saw a view that centred the body and embodiment 
as the only way to overcome uh, the distracted approaches taken by philosophers, psychologists, and scientists alike. Similarly, Beauvoir begins her book, The Second Sex, with a section laying out three different approaches, chapter by chapter, to understanding womanhood. The biological approach, the psychoanalytic approach, primarily engaging with Freud here, and then the historical materialist approach, primarily, primarily engaging with Engels. And Beauvoir explores how each of these accounts falls short of truly satisfying um, uh, the, the account for womanhood which she was um, seeking. So um, famously this quote, uh, we are not born but we become a woman, is, is an existentialist appeal. So it's, it's this idea that only being, this kind of medley of self-activity, is what um, we can really use to kind of understand what any individual womanhood or womanhood as a whole is. So both of these thinkers agreed that it's not only one perspective which we can use to grasp uh, womanhood or any other question in human behaviour. So um, Beauvoir argues for this, uh, in, in a more extended fashion, for this approach which is continually mindful of at once, biology, um, psyche, development, developmental impact of upbringing, and then also the kind of aspect of mode of production and households fitting into um, a broader economic system. So much like the queer communists in their own way, Merleau Ponty and Beauvoir were both opposed to explanations which clung to the straightforward or the reductive. Um, and their polyphonic style uh, in these great works showed up the irreducibly human way that our bodies are used to make sense of their surroundings. Um, and in particular, this, this, this uh, feature of ambiguity, so the role of crisis, uh, doubt, um, stress, reconsideration, and so on in our self-realization is something which I don't think you can really understand these thinkers without um, some focusing on. Hmm. Let's try. That's better. Okay. <coughs> Jeremy Wheat's essay, Fanon, Merleau, Ponty, and the Difference of Phenomenology, explores one famous passage in Franz Fanon's uh, black skin, white masks, as a critical deployment of earlier existentialism, and in particular Merleau-Ponty's relatively optimistic outlook on the body's place in history. As Wheat summarises for Merleau-Ponty, one might change the history of uh, the guitar, for instance, simply by picking one up and playing one. By contrast, Fanon's black skin, white masks takes a relatively more pessimistic approach. Um, today there's a lot of argument about exactly how pessimistic Fanon is, but this is him at his more pessimistic, we can say. Um, the book as a whole explores the negrophobia which Fanon describes as shaping French society, which um, in his view overdetermines the perceptions that colonial black migrants would always encounter from the white majority. In the famous Hark a Negro passage, Fanon recounters a display of casual racism from a French child which has a, a profound impact um, as an encounter on his very sense of personhood. Fanon writes, Sealed into that crushing objecthood, I turned beseechingly to others. Their attention was a liberation, running over my body, suddenly upbraided into non-being, endowing me once with an agility which I thought that I had lost, and by taking me out of the world, restoring me to it. But just as I reached the other side, I stumbled, and the movements, the attitudes, the glances of the other fixed me there in the sense in which a chemical solution is fixed by a dye. I was indignant, I demanded an explanation. Nothing happened, I burst apart. Now the fragments have been put together again by another self. Contrasting to the rather breezy view of bodies shaping history through activity sketched by Merleau-Ponty, Fanon's much less hopeful account stressed the centuries of racial denigration, the negrophobia, as he put it, which pre-code all black people from the colonies encountering the French, and I think still do today. For Fanon, the black man's skin carried the weight of colonial history. He talks about the epidermis in particular uh, as a counterpart to Merleau-Ponty's perspective. Um, a, similar, a similar approach, or at least one which, which rhymes to a certain extent, has been taken by black historian Hortense Spillers, who addresses the question of embodiment in another way in her classic 1987 essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American grammar book. As with Fanon, we see in Spillers a split established between the embodiment of those, those enslaved uh, and the free, although I think in Spillers' cases she, she seems more responsive to Merleau-Ponty's later work where he starts to explore his own metaphysical account than um, uh, the phenomenology perception, but that's, that's my own nerdy observation. Uh, anyway, Spillers writes, 
I would make a distinction in this case between body and flesh and impose the distinction as the central one between captive and liberated subject positions. In that sense, before the body there is the flesh, that zero degree of social conceptualization that does not escape concealment under the brush of discourse or the reflexes of iconography. Even though European hegemonies stole bodies, some of them female, out of West African communities in concert with the African middlemen, we regard this human and social irreparability as high crimes against the flesh, as the person of African females and African males registered the wounding. If we think of flesh as a primary narrative, then we mean it seared, divided, ripped apartness, riveted to the ship's hull, fallen or escaped overboard. This focus specifically on the flesh of slaves as they pass through the process of enslavement and intergenerational captivity leads spillers on a wide ranging exploration of material uh, including the sale of body parts by US slavers reduced down to anatomical items, um, the question of succession uh, which continues to play out across the 19th century um, and ultimately spillers argues for female flesh as simply one stress point in the broader process of total dispossession which was underway um, in the context of US slavery. Female slaves are denied a body, according to Spillers, in the juridical sense. They are unable to represent themselves and are not viable heads of household, as we see in mid 20th century moral panics, uh, including the Moynihan Report against um, black matriarchy, and that, that being a primary concern for the white establishment. Like Fanon, Spillers is committed to unveiling the difficulties of working through centuries of oppression and uses a metaphor of excavation on the first page of this essay um, to express this particular plight, she writes. The names by which I am called in the public place render an example of signifying property plus. In order for me to speak a truer word concerning myself, I must strip down through the layers of attenuated meaning made in excess in time over time, assigned by a particular historical order, and there await whatever marvels of my own inventiveness. So quite a challenge. So um, I'm going to introduce a bit more quickly this essay, um, Iris Myron Young. So Iris Myron Young uh, was a socialist feminist uh, philosopher, and her 1980 essay, Throwing Like a Girl, a phenomenology of feminine body comportment, motility, and spatiality, um, explores the question of why girls stereotypically, and often in actual fact, um, can't throw. So Young introduces um, an argument which she calls uh, female situatedness and presents this as an account of the body serving as the meeting place between transcendence, so personal expressiveness, um, and imminence, so the kind of grinding everyday expectations of society. And this, uh, this account is, is, in her view, um, well firstly it's setting up the body not only as its physiological components, um, but always <coughs> their positioning within culture and society. Her agenda here is actually to contrast the work of Simone de Beauvoir um, to Merleau-Ponty, and in fact side with Merleau-Ponty, um, arguing that um, Beauvoir's emphasis on physical, uh, on, on bodily being and physical relation as it appears in the second sex is kind of overly physiological. So um, the risk implicit in this text, she argues, is that uh, it overlooks the situatedness of uh, a woman's actual, actual body, the movement and orientation, um, as she puts it, uh, in its surroundings. And um, yeah, by contrast, kind of Young wants, wants the body to look like a diff different sort of battleground. So specifically, we express ourselves with our bodies and through them we feel simultaneously the weight of cultural expectations, embodied responses to stigma and trauma, and all the rest. So drawing free of this is of course possible on a personal level, uh, but it means foregoing the norms of femininity. Um, so becoming a tomboy or a butch or similar, um, today would say transmasculine, uh, a, a means for people simultaneously exploring the outer limits of their embodied experience that are available to them, but will also expose them to ferocious, ferocious and kind of corrosive normative policing of their behavior and so on. So, Right, so Young's phenomenological approach shows up exactly that bodily distinctions are shaped in both an intimate and everyday fashion by social expectations and cultural norms. So here femininity is not just an ideal, but in the phenomenological vocabulary, a comportment, so a way we hold ourselves, a way we, a way we are. So 
Right. Finally, Young, uh, Young um, introduces a useful, a useful distinction. So, so to explore this, uh, explore the way this plays out, she she makes a distinction between like I can and I cannot, and she describes um, the fashion in which we can observe uh, men moving through the world, often kind of encountering um, their potential motions with a sense of um, I can walk along this bank by the river, I can skip from stone to stone to another, um, with the uh, the nature of femininity or at least bourgeois femininity. Um, as Young has it, um, being kind of defined by a greater sense of confinement, self-doubt, uh, and so on, um, which obviously shapes the level of motion and kind of forms itself through the level of motion. Um, yeah, and a friend of mine called K.V. Belinsky is working on how this also plays out in the case of dyspraxia, but maybe we can talk about that in questions. So... So Monique, Monique Vatik is someone I could spend quite a while introducing because she's quite a remarkable thinker. Um, she's a self-identified red dyke, uh, a radical feminist back when that word really had a meaning um, and so on. But I just thought I would, I, would, um, I would instead just begin with a reading of her own words. And a lot of Vatik's work, uh, a lot of Vatik's work kind of straddles most effectively this boundary between um, fictional writing or like, yeah, um, yeah, fiction writing and philosophy proper. Um, and her book, The Lesbian Body, does this especially effectively. So I'll just read you a bit from that. There is not one who is unaware of what takes place here, which has no name, and yet let them seek it if they are determined to do so. Let them indulge in a storm of fine rivalries, that which I so utterly disown, while you with siren voice entreat some women with shining knees to come to your aid. But you know that not one will be able to bear seeing you with your eyes turned up lids, cut off your own yellow smoking intestines, spread in the hollow of your hands, your tongue spat from your mouth, long green strings of your bile flowing over your breasts. Not one will be able to bear your low frenetic, insistent laughter, the gleam of your teeth, your joy, your sorrow, the hidden life of your viscera, your blood, your arteries, your veins, your hollow habitations, your organs, your nerves, their rupture, rupturing there, spurting forth, death, slow decomposition, stench, being devoured by worms, your open skull, all will be equally unbearable to her. For Vatik, sex comes out of gender, what she calls uh, the fetish of sex, or elsewhere, the ideology of the material difference. And this, um, this fetish of sex makes, makes itself appear, is, is basically sex or differentiation making itself appear primary um, rather than its actually kind of secondary political uh, state. So whatever physical differences may or may not exist between men and women, taken as like an aggregate or two different groups, in social reality there's a, a kind of double life of any kind of differentiation. So the differentiations appear at once on the level of um, being there, but then again as a mobilized form from the prevailing political uh, order. So um, to put it very simply, uh, whatever differences in strength exist between men and women, this is then reappears as saying, well, of course, we can't have uh, a feminist movement because women are just objectively stronger, uh, weaker, weaker than men. So this is just this is the way things have to be. So Vatik was among the great materialist feminists in making this line of argument. And um, both her kind of fiction, which is quite tangled, as I think you maybe got there, and then also in her very kind of um, clear and breezy philosophical prose, she advances this, uh, this position. So um, rather, than, uh, rather than gender being this cultural layer, which is kind of smeared over the indisputable reality of sex, um, for Vatik, gender is really what's underlying sexual differentiation, uh, and sex differences arise from oppression uh, rather than serving as their origin point. Um, one of the metaphors Vatik uses over and over again is that of enfolding. Um, and this is kind of this is this is one of the this is thing which is sort of going on my on in my head when I'm trying to understand of these issues. So um, considering you know a, a quick reapplication for trans people, which Vatik herself never made, but which I presumptuously think should uh, endorse. Um, so, for instance, that there are there are usually physical differences between cis and trans people, but these are then mobilised by um, transphobic thinkers by saying um, either way trans people turn they sort of fail. If they manage to eliminate these, these physical differences, then they've become a stereotype, this kind of assembly of reifying stereotypes, um, and that's unacceptable. 
if they don't even bother to try and resolve these physical differences, then you know, how can we even think of this person as a real man or a real woman if they're not even trying to do that? Um, so, right, so as well as, as well as talking about enfoldment in this way, Batik argues that gender is marked onto the bodies of women, and in this respect she's very much informed by contemporary theories of racialization, uh, and she, she explicitly notes her debt to those. And, um, right, so Batik's kind of political lesbianism was neither bleak nor separatist, nor, nor separatist. So there's no kind of separatist in, impulse in this at all, whereas some other lesbian writers of her generation um, had this depiction of lesbian communal living as an opportunity to escape the male or, or divorce themselves from um, everything male. Uh, Vatik instead argued that lesbianism amounted to an undoing of womanhood. As women are only defined by their relation to men in the common order of things, uh, lesbianism severed the core relationships uh, which tended to give them any definition at all. So lesbianism would result in women ceasing to be women. And this is an early and beguilingly simple example of gender abolitionist politics, which I've explored in two essays published last year. And, um, right, so the, the most important aspect of this is that the, the uses society puts our bodies to um, are suggested not as a sturdy foundation or a point of fixity, but instead a vulnerability in a field of conflict. What Vatik calls the heterosexual order or heterosexual regime might be stifling for us, but it's also far from invulnerable. Um, and she called into question whether it could meaningfully coexist with lesbianism at all. I think the jury's still out on that one. So that's, a, that's kind of a relatively more hopeful view of um, these questions around embodiment. So I'm going to move on to some, um, some rather bleaker material, I'm afraid. If I can. There we go. Right. Yeah. As well as writing speeches, they also make memes sometimes. So, um, when considering how our bodies fail us, an important piece of ground to cover is disease. As well as hampering our quest for fulfillment, uh, even under the best possible circumstances, health conditions often merge and overlap with stigmatization. To explore this, I'm going to read you a pair of passages from the great Hegelian philosopher Gillian Rose, um, who prepared her most popular book, Love's Work, in the mid-1990s, while she uh, herself was, was readying uh, to die. Suppose that I were to reveal now that I have AIDS, full-blown AIDS, and that I have been ill during most of the course of what I have related. I would lose you. I would lose you to knowledge, to fear, and to metaphor. Such a revelation would result in the sacrifice of the alchemy of my art, of artistic control over the setting, as well as the content of your imagination. A double sacrifice of my elocution to the unspeakable, death, and to the overspoken, AIDS. I do not have AIDS, yet I seek to convey the impasses, limitations, and cruelties especially of alternative healing and of conventional medicine. I would insinuate demarks of healing that have not been imagined in either canon. I would oppose to the iatrogenic materiality of medicine and to the screw tape overdose of spirituality of alternative healing, love's work, the work I have been charting, accomplishing, but above all and necessarily failing in all along the way. If I were now to explain that in my early 40s I have cancer, say, advanced ovarian cancer, which has failed to respond to chemotherapies, and is spread through the peritoneum, the serous membrane lining in the cavity of the abdomen, in the pleura, the serous lining of the lungs, you would respond accordingly to the exigencies of taxonomy, symbol and terror, according to ignorance rather than knowledge, although there is, in fact and in spirit, no relevant knowledge. For you, cancer means, on the one hand, a lump, a species of discrete matter with multiplying properties, and on the other, a judgment, a species of ineluctable condemnation. To the bearer of this news, the term cancer means nothing. It has no meaning. It merges without remainder into the horizon within which the difficulties, the joys, the banalities of each day elapse. For context, Elsewhere in Love's work, Rose writes about her friendship with a gay New Yorker, both in, um, both in, in this book and then concerning her reaction to his death. Uh, she writes about her friend Jim uh, in Morning Becomes the Law, um, another one of her late works. 
Uh, and in Morning Becomes the Law, she recounts how the city of New York refused to claim Jim's body after his untimely death um, from AIDS-related complications, which also claimed his lover. It's striking that even as she faced down uh, the prospect of her own death, foremost in Rose's mind was a comparison to the still more stigmatized deaths some of her closest friends had been obliged to, to endure. I think Love's work came out the year before retrovirals became mass available, um, maybe two years. Um, Yet yeah, this is not, not to say that cancer is confronted in a healthy fashion either, so I'm gonna read you a second quote where Rose explores and corrects um, the silence which had previously prevailed concerning the accompanying treatment. Nowhere in the endless romance of world literature, my experience is, needless to say, limited, have I come across an account of living with a colostomy. Since the first colostomy was performed in this country in 1797, the first paper on the subject published in 1805, colostomies have been a routine medical practice uh, since the second half of the 19th century. This is more than enough time for lyric and lament. A colostomy is an opening of the colon onto the abdomen. It is usually performed for people who have chronic bowel disorders. For them, it is a great relief, a new lease of life. I have no history of bowel disorder. The remaining seedlings, tiny pinpricks of cancer, were located in the lining of the bowel, so that when 20% of it was removed, together with the other organs infected with metastases, the bowel was not rejoined there in case, um, in case of a growth of tumour at the join. Leakage of bowel contents into the abdominal cavity is fatal. In principle, the colostomy was temporary, to be re reversed after the successful application of chemotherapy, which would dissolve the seedlings. Let me make myself clear. The colostomy, stoma means opening, is a surrogate rectum and anus. Tight coils of concentric, fresh, blood-red flesh, millimetres, one inch in diameter, protrude a few millimetres from the centre left of my abdomen, just below the waist. Blueness would be a sign of distress. This is comparatively easy to put into prose, because it is likely to be utterly unfamiliar. But how to inscribe my relation to this operation? Changed body image has already become an overworked cliche, which anyhow relates to motor and imaginary self-representation, and not to the resitting of bodily function. I want to talk about shit, the hourly transfiguration of our lovely eating of the sun. I need to remove the discourse of shit from transgression, sexual fetishism, from too much interest, but equally from coyness, distaste, and the medical textbook. My interest is in the uncharted, my difficulty that I will inevitably enlist by connotation and implication, the power and grace of the symbol. I need to invent colostomy ethnography. Um, so having read you some lamenting words from the 20th century's greatest British Galian, uh, as she, prepared to death, uh, as she prepared for her death, I'm now going to turn to a bit more hopeful material as we approach, as we approach the close. Um, and I'm going to take us back, back to the essay I began this talk with, um, The Queer Communists on Refusing Simple Answers. And the material they cover in the second part of this essay is, has since then been covered by uh, at least two documentary filmmakers and an increasing number of scholars. And this is the episode of the Zagorsky experiment. Um, uh, which in the Soviet Union prepared three deaf-blind youth for admission into the Moscow State University. Um, in particular, the queer communists and both of these documentary filmmakers have honed in on the role played by the USSR's greatest humanist philosopher, Ival Dilyankov. Lacking the sight of sense, uh, sorry, lacking the senses of sight and hearing is usually taken to be a dual disability so harsh that people struggle to imagine the level of detachment from the empirical as conventionally understood, which would ensue. One of the three youth uh, who Ival Ilyankov was working with, Alexander Suvorov, um, had lost, uh, lost the use of his senses as a teenager, and he wrote of his struggle with his, his new condition as follows. That morning on learning there was no cure, I ran out of the bathroom to the playground and cried for three hours. It was a moment of realization. Deaf blindness is my everlasting nightmare, something which makes me inferior, which separates me from the world and all its culture, enormity and beauty. I missed music most of all. Later I cursed my disease for other reasons, above all the inability to see, hear and admire loved ones. In a state of despair and near suicidal, um, Suvorov wrote to Ilyenkov, admitting um, 
admitting to the, uh, his plight and outlining um, all, the, uh, all the culture he couldn't really encounter. For instance, paintings. At this time, um, museums were unlikely to let you fondle sculpture, so that was also um, not, not available to him and so on. And in reply, Elyankov responded in a twofold way. Firstly, he made no move to downplay Severo's plight. He conceded that living without two of one's senses, and those two in particular, was a great hurdle in achieving a fulfilling life. However, however he pressed on to argue that Severov was simply facing up to the same conditions which all philosophers struggle with, the limitations of our senses. As Ilyankov had it, deaf blindness does not create a single, even wholly microscopic problem, which would not be a universal problem. Deaf blindness only makes them more acute. It does nothing more. Um, as some of you may know, Severov refrained from suicide and has since become a professor of psychology, authoring more than 20 books, and um, in this way kind of vindicating the experiment once and for all, it's safe to say. So, Ilyankov's work with deafblind children and youth insisted on their human potential um, still being reachable, and um, I think the aftermath has kind of affirmed his estimation. What interested me most when I encountered this um, evaluation uh, once I encountered this experiment, is that this is very similar to what in Western Europe in the later 20th century would become known as the social model of disability. Um, and um, right, and and the um, the kind of uh, core phrase which um, Ilyankov developed coming out of this is that personality, all that is human in life, is 100% social, not even 90% or 99% and that lives which are common, commonly discarded by society, those who are disabled in the um, passive sense of that word by their circumstances, in truth only need to be reached out to and given the encouragement um, and support they require to be able to secure their own flourishing. Now at this point I've covered quite a lot of ground. Right, so you may be wondering having drawn together this huge array of examples um, from the muscles of workers becoming jellied abstraction, according to Marx, to the shattering of Franz Fanon as a black man, to Rose's terminal cancer, um, causing to reflect on herself even as her body finally fell short, um, to the case of Soviet deafblind children, or at least three of them, um, what exactly my argument is. So I've presented this purposefully uh, complex, complex argument um, to you, but to reduce it to its simplest form, um, the body is not a given. Oh, we'll get there. So close to the end. No, it's fine. I think you can see it anyway. There we go. Right now, this is this is this this is a perspective which is actually which is actually taken for granted in many theory circles. Um, but sadly, theory much like. Uh, much like economies, doesn't really operate on a trickle-down basis. We kind of can't, we can't rely that, that saying that theorists take for granted is really going to percolate and leave into the outside world. Um, this year in particular, uh, there's been a, a true ascendancy of transphobic um, feminism in my, in my um, home country of the United Kingdom. And there we've seen uh, liberal newspapers from The Guardian to The Times to The Economist, so all of the kind of official papers of record, um, present really crude lines which treat kind of sexual differentiation, male and female, a thing which is just taken for granted, a thing which we can just assume and then do gender theory on top of. So clearly the time has come for a bit of restatement. Um, in the perspective which I'm outlining here, um, uh, the body changes through the, courses, uh, through the course of history. These are both measurable in centuries of systematic oppression, uh, historical accounting, and then also in narrative moments, in formations and breaks of our own lives. Our brief jaunt through the history of thought today has shown up the complexity at work in embodiment. A range of different thinkers in an array of different contexts have explored the ways in which the body is a site which history works through and with which we can work uh, and rework history. So how can this inform our political action? Uh, I can only reaffirm that we have to avoid atomistic responses um, in the current context and also to, to kind of make efforts to bring into view the circles of outcasts, um, freaks and unremunerated workers who've already been working to transform um, people on the physical level into acting bodies. And um, 
Yeah, and I think especially when uh, when the church and an increasing number of retrograde feminists um, argue, for instance, that transition or living your life as a lesbian and so on uh, is a, an instance of gender ideology, they tend to miss out on the bedrock social activity, which enables both trans and queer life. Um, and I, I think one real benefit of kind of focusing on the level of community activity uh, which I can outline some more in questions, is that the critics of gender ideology tend not to really understand this and have kind of refused, um, in their simplicity, they've kind of refused to, to come to an understanding of exactly how it is that we live. Finally, as an ethical point, today what matters is not only advancing our ideas, as I've tried to do today, but also building serviceable uh, lives for ourselves, which are fit to survive through the current um, counter-offensive. And so politically, I can only restate myself one last time. Uh, I think at this moment, there's no room for compromise, dumbing down, um, beijing out, excising the awkward, toning down the freak freakish, or kind of casting out the unsightly. So this is, I think, uh, a high time to be awkward and to show solidarity with other freaks. And I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much.